some very impressive efforts have been shared with us today. Uh, uh, a wealth of information uh, that was, you know, I, my quick review of this previously, I didn't realize the wealth of information that you folks have assembled. So look forward to using this more in the future. Um, I'm, I'm gonna jump to a question that was relayed, uh, relayed in by Melinda. Uh, she heard uh, a little bit of discussion uh, uh, Dana about the uh, Burma filtration or Burma culture. Uh, just uh, I think she's wanting uh, maybe a, a little bit of starting information about that. Uh, could you maybe give us a, a quick overview of that? And I, I know we have a couple of people from North Carolina State that uh, where well, there's some other work being done. If they want to add anything in the Q and A box, they'd be more than welcome. So Dana, any thoughts on Burma culture and its role? Yeah, there's there's. Um... NC State, I think, has done a, a lot more work in this space. Cornell, I know, is, has been engaged as well there. Um, the vermicompost that we have here doesn't use redworms, um, but they're using raw food waste and maintaining a, an active bed. Um, the goal there, you know, with the, the, the worms we're using is to create the finished carbon, um, whereas the redworms, it's actually a collection of the casings. And, and I don't have as much experience or knowledge with the redworms, and so I guess I would look to the resources, uh, other resources for more information on that. Okay. There is a entry for vermifiltration on the nutrient catalog. The company is Biofiltro. Um, the Biofiltro system is designed um, and in operation on a couple of, in, of installations in California and up the West Coast. And a lot of that work, study work on emissions and the treatment efficiency of that technology has been done by Frank Mittlander at UC Davis, also a member of the nutrient technology team. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for that, that update on that. A um, couple of questions uh, popped up in the box that I'm going to lump together, and they, they focus around commercial byproducts or byproducts that have been successfully integrated into urban markets. Uh, do you have any uh, uh, thoughts in terms of some of the products that you've seen that are producing a, a viable product uh, for commercial markets? Well, there's been a, it, it depends on where you, how, how far you're going on commercial. There's some products, for example, Magic Dirt, that's made significant inroads at your local Walmart as a potting soil. And that product is, essentially starts with digested dairy fiber. And so you're, you're actually seeing some of that start to work its way into the mainstream. Uh, another company, Midwestern BioAg, has developed a commercial fertilizer that's manure based. And they've built a, a plant, I believe probably one of the first in the nation, that actually is a true commercial fertilizer plant that uses manure as its primary ingredient for the fertilizer base. So as we're seeing more interest in soil health initiatives and, and again, that circular economy and building the soil back up, we are seeing more opportunities in this area. And there, there are opportunities for us to get into the retail urban markets. But if you remember, if we just get back to our own farms, we're going to end up needing to bring in nutrients from other areas because we we can't completely mass balance if we're shipping out our, our products with nutrients in them. So if we do a really effective job of taking care of the nutrients and getting them back to where we're getting our feeds from, we actually don't need to have, the only time you would go to other areas is when it makes economic sense, when there'd be a value add for it. In, in cow pots, that's another one that's a great example of a, a market product. You know, coming off of a small farm, I see there's a question related to farm size, and that's not a big dairy, but they're producing a lot of, of uh, pots for the bedding industry, the plant industry. Uh, Teresa asks the question of technologies and their potential for being economical for smaller livestock farms. Any thoughts in terms of top or types of technologies that might have more benefit for the smaller farm? So coarse solid wood separation is used widely on, on all farm sizes. Um, 
Beyond that, it really goes to what is your cost to manage manure and what are your limitations with managing manure? And so, um, you know, the technologies are all scalable or modular, so they can go up and down in size. Um, I know in our case for, for our campus farms here, we have looked very hard at going to uh, find solids recovery because our cost to land, out, land apply manure in our available land base is, is the land base is limited and the cost to export manure for us uh, is extremely high. So we're 250 cow dairy. Um, you know, the, the break even point for us to, to go to, uh, to find solid separation is actually pretty reasonable. And so, it, but it, it's really situational based on the farm's needs. Mark, anything you want to add to that? No, I think each region is unique as well. Um, for example, most, most places aren't going to need to get to clean water or do that salt removal step. But in California, where they have a more arid climate, the salts are starting to build up in the upper layer of the soil. And for them, that's a real concern. And that's an area they may have to look at, at uh, investing in. But it really, as you look at the different size farms, many of these technologies start out being um, applicable only to the very biggest farms because of the cost. But as those farms start to grow, and, and the technology becomes more mature, we see smaller and smaller versions become available. And I just recently was up in Vermont and saw a, a video of a digester system that could be used for 100 cows or so. And it would have been, uh, uh, the video literally showed the digester pad being there and two weeks later, the whole thing being up. It was put together by a crew of three guys. Everything came in containers and, and on, a, on a truck and they dropped it in there. So we see these economies of scale come down and we see more opportunities, you know, based on the technology maturing. Excellent. Okay. Uh, we've got a, quite a number of questions in here. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them today because our time is going to wrap up here pretty shortly. Uh, mentioned a couple of times about energy related, energy recovery related technologies. Uh, one question was related to pyrolysis. Any general comments that you'd like to make about uh, technologies for energy recovery that you think are, are looking more promising? I'll tell you the concern that all energy recovery projects have right now is with the exception right now of renewable natural gas into the transportation industry, which can get renewable identification numbers and low carbon fuel standard numbers, you're dealing with a commodity that the United States has been very, very good at driving the cost down. In many areas of the country, electricity costs more to make out of dairy manure than you can buy it over the grid from. In many areas of the country, natural gas is less than $5. You know, we can't treat manure and basically accelerate the, the natural gas production process for those type of prices. And so unless you can find very specific markets like the renewable natural gas to transportation fuel, it's very difficult to make projects go on an energy only basis. Okay. All right. Very good. A um, couple of, uh, so one question from uh, uh, Daniel that I'd like to run by uh, uh, Mark here today. Uh, he's asking uh, how could he engage uh, your organization, Nutrient, in looking at a potential solution to a, a specific issue they're dealing with? And, and then are there grants out there available for helping do some of the engineering analysis of the, for solutions? Well, NRCS does have grants available for doing feasibility studies, and there's technologies that are approved by NRCS for EQIP funding. And then you can certainly, if you're in the dairy industry, you can certainly reach out, reach out to me and uh, we, can, we can have a conversation. If you're not in the dairy industry, you can still reach out to me, but we probably would have to, would have to talk a little bit more in general terms just because we're not as familiar with the technology. But it's not that we won't work with people who are outside of the dairy industry. It's just Right now, that's our primary focus. Um, 
can't ask the question, uh, the EPA is restarting work on developing emission factors and we'll be looking at treatment technologies for air emissions. Uh, does the resources through the nutrients compiling, do they address some of these from an air emissions perspective? I think the critical indicators do to some extent. Um, the nitrogen recovery indicator is indicative probably of the ammonia because that's how you typically lose nitrogen is through the ammonia unless you're nitrifying and denitrifying. The other um, potential emission, although it's not an emission, is odor. And I think technologies that reduce or eliminate odor, reduce or minimize greenhouse gas release, and reduce or minimize ammonia release are those technologies that are going to be the biggest impact on uh, the air factors. Yeah. And, I, and I think you, you make a good point, Mark, uh, that uh, you can look at the nutrient, the nitrogen recovery, and the inverse of that or what's left over after the nitrogen recovery could be a pretty close estimate of the ammonium emission because like you said, that's where we would, and that's how we, many of our approaches for estimating ammonia emissions for some of our, our, our standard systems has been by looking at what we recover and, and subtracting from that to get to an ammonia emission. So uh, there are some possibilities there. All right, uh, let's see, Mark, is there an interest in the manure to uh, to fertilizer option that starts with swine manure, or is this all for dairy? I think you've many, answered a little bit of that, but go ahead. Many of the technologies that Dana mentioned can be used on on pork manure, or uh, even we we even have anaerobic digesters that are in operation on poultry sites. So it's not that they're exclusive. It's just the the technologies tend to change a little bit by the nature. And as, as Dana described, and by the nutrient content. And so, for example, uh, poultry tends to be very dry. You can handle that in, in systems that you couldn't handle a slurry or that you couldn't, uh, that you can't handle, you know, there's some systems that we are really dealing with water, and I think pork more falls into that because of the current collection techniques is you're really dealing with something that's very liquid, more similar to what you see in a municipal plant and that tends to that tends to cost a little more because you're dealing with so much volume and Dana from your perspective any particular technologies or approaches that you've seen showing up more in the swine industry um, no I, I really don't have anything to add there I don't you know it, swine is tricky just given the way the, the the housing is structured and the manure collection is structured that, um, you know, it's hard to have consistent flows to be able to treat that. And then uh, challenges, you know, with uh, the high protein content and uh, hair in the manure streams um, have also been difficult for manure treatment to, to handle. So I, I'm not seeing a lot there. Okay, all right. Uh, Gentlemen, I, I really appreciate uh, all the information you've shared with us today. A uh, great overview today, Dana, of kind of the different systems and the approaches and kind of how to subdivide them in our minds as to what we're trying to accomplish. And uh, Mark, it uh, looks like you have a tremendous resource here for kind of sorting through these technologies and what's begun to uh, demonstrate some commercial applications. So really appreciate you sharing those resources with us today. Thank you for inviting I, us. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen.